This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. This chapter introduces a concept of ethics and looks at the importance of ethics in businesses. As it says on this slide, uh, ethics is a branch of philosophy uh, that involves examining, categorizing, justifying and recommending concepts of right and wrong behavior. So in a business context, what sort of behavior is regarded as being correct and ethical uh, and what is regarded as being unethical? For example, uh, inducements or bribery. Uh, the very word bribery we tend to think is unethical, uh, but what about an inducement, a commission uh, to give an order to a certain supplier, uh, for example? Uh, what about business entertainment, which in a way is a potentially a form of inducement? Uh, what about what's called insider trading? Insider trading is where somebody within a company knows it's about to announce very good results or uh, has, has heard about a takeover that, that may uh, be happening to that company. They go out and they buy shares before anyone else finds out about this good news. So they buy shares at a low price, the good news is announced and the shares tend to go up to a much higher price, allowing that person, but not general shareholders or the general public, to make a profit. Fifty years ago, uh, there was uh, no particular laws against uh, something like insider trading. It wasn't regarded as being unethical. Uh, many people would joke, that's why I have a stockbroker. I expect my stockbroker to know what's happening. Uh, now, uh, insider trading is uh, frowned on, uh, and in many countries will get you a lengthy jail term. And this brings us to this distinction, really, between uh, ethical theories, which are based on absolute values, uh, something is definitely wrong, and is definitely wrong for all time, and relative values, uh, where we think this is right, the other person thinks somebody else is right. We, we kind of agree maybe to respect our different points of view. And also we are willing to let our ethical uh, standpoint change or evolve. Uh, so insider trading, as I said, has become illegal in many countries. Uh, bribery, there's been much more uh, tightening up on bribery. Uh, new ethics have had to develop uh, with uh, regard to personal information held on computers. Uh, to whom can this be released? Is it ethical that uh, companies like Google uh, amount to amass huge amounts of information on users? Some, uh, uh, for, for, for some people, there are obviously going to be absolute values which are unlikely to ever change. Uh, for example, in Islamic finance, the concept of interest uh, is regarded as being uh, unethical. Uh, it, it, it is uh, what sort of haram. It is not allowed as uh, part of a business uh, behavior. Whereas in uh, uh, finance, which is not Islamic based, interest is a fairly normal and expected way of earning interest, of earning money, of getting a reward for the capital uh, that you have uh, provided to, to someone. And those are unlikely to change. Those are likely to be absolute. There are some values which are likely to be more universal than others. So uh, in, in most philosophies, if you like, theft is regarded as being uh, wrong, uh, although then it leaves open the question of what exactly is theft. Uh, similarly, murder is regarded as being wrong in general, uh, although, of course, one has to uh, begin making allowances for maybe self-defense and judicial uh, execution and so on. So there's a very much a, a, a you know, quite a, a movement and sometimes difference of opinion in, in what is ethical and what isn't. Now, the major schools of ethics are the following. There is what's called the teleological school or utilitarianism or consequentialism. And this says, uh, this, these schools are helping us to try to decide what is ethical, what isn't ethical, rather than just kind of reading it in a book and, and kind of believing it. It tries to burrow down a little bit and says, what is the, the actual justification for this being right and this being wrong? 
And the first school here, this utilitarianism or teleological uh, school, says that something is right or wrong based primarily on its consequences. Uh, so an act is right if the consequences of the act are good, are, are, are in a way benevolent, are helpful uh, to people. Uh, utilitarianism uh, summarizes as the uh, greatest good for the greatest number. Um, now, you may think that sounds good uh, as a good way of deciding what is right and, and what is wrong. If you had a decision to make, which of these decisions is going to produce the greatest good for the greatest number? But it, it soon gets you into problems if you think about it. Let's say uh, there were 10 patients uh, who all required various transplants of various sorts. So somebody needed a heart, lungs, two people needed kidneys, somebody needed livers, somebody needed corneal grafts, and uh, uh, so on. And here am I, uh, let's say a healthy person, all these organs functioning, and we'll say these people who need the organs will die, they don't get them. Now, you could argue the greatest good for the greatest number is to sacrifice me, give my heart to that person, my lungs to that person, my kidneys to that person. I'd be saving, you know, maybe half a dozen people for the sake of one person's life. But I think and hope that very few people would go along with that as an ultimate answer. Deontology uh, looks at duties. What are the uh, duties that are required of you? This is rather more based, perhaps, in philosophy, perhaps in uh, religion, uh, that there is some sort of moral imperative, moral duty, uh, that you are on the, to follow a certain course of action. So, so that is duty-based. I should say we're not going to get to any answers uh, on some of these moral or ethical areas, uh, but we need to know the, the terminology which is involved within that. Virtue ethics, uh, uh, another school, uh, tries to say, well, uh, what, in a way, what gives rise to what you might call having lived a good life? What are the proper virtues that we should pursue? So it might list up that as far as possible, uh, you should be tolerant of other people and other people's views. It might list up that you should uh, give money to charity because that is a charity that is a virtuous pursuit and so on. Uh, it would say that if you see someone's life is in danger, you should warn them because that that is again is leading to virtue. It would say that you should not be greedy uh, because uh, greed is the reverse of a virtue and, and so on. So it tries to say almost uh, if you're on your deathbed, looking back at your life saying, have I lived a good life, a virtuous life, maybe even a worthwhile life, a, 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 worth, a worthwhile life, uh, and, and, and tries to judge ethics on that basis. As I say, uh, even with these three schools, uh, uh, you know, two of us can easily disagree on the utilitarianism approach, the, the deontological approach, and the, the virtue ethics uh, but this simply is saying that the ethics is quite a quite a tricky uh, area to and very difficult to actually to have absolute values on, or for a, a universal set of absolute values at any rate. Now we have to think, uh, even if we're not very sure. Uh, that there is an absolute uh, list of good ethical stances or good ethical decisions. Uh, 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 we may disagree on, on, on some of them from time to time. Uh, what is the effect of poor ethics on a business? Uh, and we don't even have to appeal to here, I want to be ethical because I want to be a good person, uh, or, or, or I need to be ethical because I want to, to, to get to heaven or anything of that sort. We, we can say that ethical behavior, however that is understood, is simply good for business. Uh, if you are a business which is regarded as being unethical, then there is increased risk. 
Uh, if you, uh, for example, conceal some problem uh, a product of yours uh, has, and maybe the product is kind of damaging people, uh, then, of course, you are liable to come in for huge fines, uh, compensation to the people who were hurt, and so on. Uh, there may be regulatory penalties. Uh, you may be stopped business. You may be told you can't trade anymore because you are a, a, an untrustworthy business. And this has been seen, for example, in the pharmaceutical industry, where it was thought that some pharmaceutical firms, they had a, 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 a drug which was very, very good, let's say for heart disease or arthritis. Uh, but this uh, drug that was good for arthritis uh, happened to have side effects, or after about five years, it was discovered uh, that there were side effects which increased people's rate of having heart attacks. Now that, on uh, un unwanted side effects coming to light in a drug company is, is a normal part of the risk in a drug company, but what really caused them trouble uh, was that it was discovered that they actually had some evidence that this drug had these dangerous side effects, and they covered it up. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, when that was found, then, you know, their share price dropped kind of 30%, huge uh, damages to pay, huge uh, penalties to pay, and so on. And, of course, it was a huge damage to their reputation. If risk increases, if your uh, reputation is hurt and your goodwill goes down, uh, then there's going to be an increased cost of finance. The cost of finance, whether it's shares or loans, is linked to risk. Higher risk businesses uh, should reward their shareholders or the providers of loan finance with higher returns. And of course, if a drug company is cheated in one drug, people are worried, what other drugs have they got there? They've got these side effects that they haven't come out with yet. Uh, and so they're going to be reluctant to lend or invest to you uh, unless the price is very high. Your share price goes down, you're going to lose customers because they've got no faith in you, therefore your profits go down. Uh, uh, employees, recruits, bright people coming out of university would rather go to another company rather than uh, kind of be tainted by working uh, for this company which has got this bad reputation. Uh, and then finally, if you want to get into cooperation, joint ventures, who wants to get into a joint venture with someone who has this dreadful uh, reputation for ethical behavior uh, and, uh, and and is therefore a very risky sort of company. So good ethics, being honest, being open with people, uh, not cheating, if you like, uh, is, is, is good for business, uh, as simple as that. Now, where do we get our ethical rules from? And these are the uh, sources for accountants. There is the law, the law of the land, of course, we live in different lands, different countries. And this comes top, however. Uh, you mustn't break the law, whatever the law says. Uh, then there is IFAC, the International Federations of Accountants. Uh, IFAC uh, imposes a got an ethical code. Uh, and this is produced by the IESBA, uh, the International Ethics Standards Board for Accountants. This is a subcommittee of IFAC. And they have this ethical code, which has been adopted by many, many uh, accountancy bodies, including SEMA. In the UK, there is the Financial Reporting Council as well. This is our local regulatory uh, type of organisation. that uh, looks after the behaviour of companies on the stock exchange and, uh, and so on, the behaviour of banks and, and the like. And they have a conduct committee. So if they think, uh, for example, uh, that banks have been rigging interest rates, as has been discovered recently, uh, then they can investigate and they can fine the banks or other financial institutions huge amounts of money uh, because they have broken ethical principles and rules. There is the Auditing Practices Board. Uh, this is part of the uh, Financial Reporting uh, Council. Uh, 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 this is uh, something which looks specifically at auditing and professional behaviour in auditing. And we'll see some uh, uh, more detail of that later on. And then there is SEMA. 
Uh, SEMA has largely adopted all of the IESBA ethical code, uh, and we'll see the uh, the sorts of uh, basically five basic principles that members of SEMA uh, have to follow, uh, and we'll see how they can anticipate certain threats to that, and how they should respond to those threats, so they don't get into trouble. We'll see that in the next chapter. Many uh, companies uh, begin to, or have begun, to issue ethical codes. Uh, in other words, rather than just leaving it up to individual employees to try to decide what they think is ethical, and of course you get many, many different answers coming out from that, because companies are so aware that good ethics is so important to the long-term business success, the sustainable business success, they don't want to leave it up to chance, and they issue ethical codes. Uh, just issuing a bit of paper isn't good enough. There has to be training. It has to be supported from the top. Uh, uh, you don't want people just doing this as a kind of lip service to ethics. It, it, there's only a point in doing this that people are going to take ethics seriously uh, and are going to try to follow the codes. The sorts of areas which are covered by typical ethical codes, and there's one in your notes uh, setting out Amazon's ethical code, and it's really interesting to, to, to look at that. Uh, equal opportunity and discrimination. So you're a manager, uh, you have got two uh, employees, uh, you need one of them to be promoted to be a supervisor. It would say that the only th considerations you should have and which one gets the promotion is which is going to be better at the job. It shouldn't be discriminatory in terms of whether one is male, one is female, uh, one is black, one is white, and so on. Well, well no religion, uh, that would all be uh, discrimination. These, these people should have all people, all employees, all potential recruits, uh, all customers, all suppliers. Uh, there should be equal opportunities. Bullying. Uh, bullying, quite a, a big issue now. Uh, usually coming from managers down to their staff, uh, being really nasty and un unfair, uh, almost causing illness among members of their staff. But it can, happen, it can actually happen at one level. You have you know, six people in a department, five of them get on, one is a bit different perhaps, doesn't mix just as well, and, and they pick on this person. Uh, and that, if that happens, certainly in the UK, there can be really large compensation payments to the person who has been bullied. We need to look at use of the internet. Uh, uh, use of the internet, uh, perhaps, uh, well, there's a waste of time, obviously, browsing the internet during work. But then, of course, is, well, what are you looking at on the internet? What are you downloading from the internet? Uh, what message are you setting, sending to, to people over the internet or on Twitter or on Facebook and so on? Uh, is this damaging the workplace? and your company. We should uh, have some guidance on reporting wrongdoing. There, 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 there should be someone that you know, you're told, if you think something's going wrong, if you think somebody is bullying somebody else, who do you go to to report that to? How do you make that representation? Uh, what you don't want to do is people seeing something wrong uh, and either sitting on it because they're frightened or not knowing who's going to deal with that. And sometimes, of course, reporting to your manager isn't going to work. The manager might be the source of, for example, bullying. So there has to be then some guidance. Well, if your manager can't help, where else do we go in the organization? Bribery. What is bribery? Uh, some countries have got quite strict laws now about bribery. Many companies have got even stricter laws about bribery. Uh, and obviously, there are different sorts of bribery. Uh, Proper bribery, if you like, is giving people a lot of money to do something they shouldn't do. Uh, then you have something which is sometimes called facilitation payments or uh, grease payments, which is giving someone somebody money to get them to do maybe faster what they should be doing. So if you have goods held up at customs, the customs officer will eventually get round to inspecting them, but there's a long wait. So you give the customs officer, you know, couple of thousand euros or dollars to say, can you bring my stuff to the front of the queue, then, then that is a facilitation payment. 
And then it, it kind of goes down into what happens if we take somebody out for lavish meal? What happens if we give them gifts and, uh, and so on? Uh, what happens if we say, well, if you order from this, we can also send some, 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 some materials to your home for your personal use. All of this is, it comes really under the heading of bribery. Money laundering. Uh, we need to know, businesses need to be careful uh, about where money comes from, from their customers. Uh, they need to be, uh, particularly banks, uh, they need to be uh, doing investigations. If somebody goes in and says, I want to deposit $100,000, uh, and the bank has never seen this potential customer before, banks shouldn't just take the money. How do you know that $100,000 hasn't come in from drugs, uh, from uh, uh, prostitution, from people smuggling, uh, uh, all sorts of ways and, and, and so on, uh, which are themselves unethical and then the money is tainted. And many, many countries have got very stringent laws now about money laundering and reporting money laundering. Uh, even a suspicion of money laundering in the UK has to be reported. And what about conflicts of interest? So you are the purchasing officer of a company and your brother uh, is uh, the owner of a potential company which is supplying to you. Well, there you have a conflict of interest. Uh, you want your brother's company to do well, uh, but of course, maybe your brother's company isn't the best supplier, either by quality or price. We need to know how to handle these conflicts of interest you certainly have to tell people about it and maybe what you need to do is to stand aside and let somebody independent decide on that purchase contract broadly there are two uh, approaches to ethical codes you can have a rules or compliance based approach which is basically really where you have questions and checklists and people have to sign off uh, these checklists Maybe when particular contracts are being signed, or maybe once a year. So they have to kind of sign off that, yes, I have uh, exercised proper um, recruitment of people, there's been no discrimination and so on. Uh, yes, I have ensured that there's no bullying going on within my team of people and so on. Uh, yes, I am not aware of any bribery or inducements that have been offered to people. So a list of very specific questions that people kind of sign off. The good thing about that uh, is, of course, that you have evidence that people have gone through the ethical checklist. Uh, you have evidence of what they've covered and that they've signed it off and so on. Uh, the bad thing is that if uh, there's something... Uh, that could be ethically dubious and there isn't a specific question covering it, uh, does this let people off the hook? What happens if there's no question there, maybe about health and safety, yet you see one of your employees is adopting dangerous work practices and you say nothing about it, there was nothing to tick off on the ethical code, are you in the clear? The other uh, approach is a frameworks or principles-based approach this is where you give people broad ethical guidelines and lots of training and then you let them get on with it uh, and, and let them in a way make up. You, you, you have to trust them to make proper ethical decisions. They're, they're not signing off a checklist and so on, uh, but they are in their own mind thinking all the time at the front of their mind is this ethical the bad thing about it is that some people may not be very good at imagining ethical problems. Uh, there's no evidence that they've actually done it. The good thing about it is, of course, there's less administration uh, and it is more open to novel ethical threats. You're not confined just to what is in the, the list that you've had to tick off. Finally, uh, we uh, need to, to realise that if someone is going to be working ethically in a business, uh, the business ethics and their personal ethics have to, in a way, align. Uh, particularly, maybe, if we're dealing here with a frameworks or principle-based approach. So if uh, you uh, have got, personally, some particular view on what proper recruitment is, 
So if you think, uh, uh, for some reason, that you think it is better to recruit, let's say, male employees, uh, nevertheless, the ethical code of the company is over here somewhere, and it says, no, we want equal employment opportunities of male and female. If you're like that, uh, then ethics, the ethical treatment of recruits, isn't going to come naturally to you. It's going to fall short a little bit. Uh, it's a bit like, uh, well, okay, I'll, 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 I'll try to be fair, but deep down you probably won't be fair. You can always invent some idea, some, some reason, if you like, why you should give the job to that person, not that person. Uh, and, and these reasons are really fired or, or, or created by your own prejudices or your own different ethical stunts. What we need to try and do is to bring these together uh, so that the ethics of your staff essentially overlap and match with the ethics of the business. That way you can trust much more that your staff are going to act in ethical ways so far as the business is concerned. The way you can do this is to recruit. Uh, at the recruitment stage, you could maybe identify people who have maybe got deeply ingrained prejudices uh, and you know that maybe no matter how much you train them, that they will never change. Although you have to be careful that, that ruling people out with strongly held beliefs uh, is, is not itself an unethical thing to do. So, but really kind of saying that they're almost, we think they're beyond hope. Training. You can train people. So they may start off slightly different, but by training you say, this is why uh, we need to give equal opportunities. It's because if we don't, then we're missing out on half the workforce. If we don't, then we have a workforce which is all like us, but our customers are very, very varied. Shouldn't, shouldn't there be some match between the kind of population of our customers and the people in the company? so that people in the company better understand and have more empathy with our customers. So good training can go a long way to make the ethical stances converge. Give people an ethical code. Write down what's right and what's wrong. And of course give training on that. And then there is corporate culture. The corporate culture coming, corporate culture is always set from the top. Corporate culture is sometimes regarded as the way we do things around here, the proper way, the accepted way that we do things around here. And if you do something different, then that is likely to be criticised or frowned upon. So what you need is the people at the top saying, yes, we, we, we do want to give people equal opportunities. Yes, uh, we, we are very concerned with health and safety. Yes, we, we do want to be honest and straightforward with our customers uh, because all of these ethical stances, if you like, uh, not only may they, be, may they be absolutely good, may be virtuous, but they are good for business. Uh, and this coming from the top down through the organisation instills or persuades people further down to adopt the same ethical standpoint as the business. Within businesses, so the, the kind of uh, desirable uh, modes of behaviour, if you like, you want people to be reliable. If they say they're going to do something, they're going to do it. Uh, they're not going to tell lies. They want to take responsibility. Uh, meaning, of course, that if they take responsibility for an action and something goes wrong, they're not going to try and push the blame to somebody else. People should be willing to say, I messed up on that and so on. If people try to push the blame on somebody else, then you find that things don't really improve. Many organisations, particularly airlines, want a kind of no-blame culture. So if a pilot is aware that he or she has you know, done something wrong during the flight, had a bit of a bumpy landing, whatever the problem is, uh, pilots are encouraged to confess this uh, on a kind of no-blame basis so that, that they, obviously, by confessing, learn uh, or realize they've done wrong, but they're maybe 
passing on useful advice and hints to other people who may find themselves in a similar situation. Timeliness. Get to work on time. If you say you're going to produce something in two days' time, you produce it in two days' time, uh, uh, rather than having you know, weeks so annoying, these delays. Uh, courtesy to everyone uh, within the organisation, outside the organisation, and so on. And respect. Respect for people's views. Maybe respect for people's religions. Uh, so people will disagree with you, not only in moral issues, but maybe in what should be done uh, in a business, what product they should pursue and so on. Uh, and uh, rather than kind of shouting at them or, or ignoring them or whatever, whatever you're going to be doing, you should listen to them uh, and say, well, OK, I hear what you say, but these are the reasons that I think we should be doing something else. Respect doesn't mean uh, that you acquiesce to all of their ideas.